welcome to another episode of Going All In, Get the Edge You Need to Succeed. I'm Dr. Erin McKinley, and today we have another awesome spotlight session with Susan Roberts and Ashley Mullins from the Baylor University Medical Center Dietetic Internship based in Dallas, Texas. All right, welcome. We're going to get started with some introductions, and we will start with Susan. Please introduce yourself. Give us a little history of your journey to RD and how you landed at Baylor University Medical Center. All right, thank you, Erin. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Susan Roberts. I'm the Dietetic Internship Director and our Director of Clinical Nutrition at Baylor University Medical Center. And I've spent most of my career here at the Medical Center. I started out in the uh, blood and marrow transplant and oncology area. I spent some time in organ transplant, worked with um, nutrition support a lot throughout my career. So for the first 14 years, I worked in clinical nutrition and it was a great experience in terms of having the opportunity to work with the multidisciplinary team, conduct research, give presentations. And I learned so much through that, that when an, a management position became open, I was a little hesitant, but I wanted to try something new. So in 2004, I became a clinical nutrition manager here. And uh, again, just, just so many opportunities to learn and grow and work with the team and promote those same activities that I had had the opportunity to do. And then in 2008, um, the, the former director had some different responsibilities that took her away from the campus a lot. So I was given the chance to move into the internship director position at that point in time. And it was something that I'd always had my eye on and just thought, you know, if I ever get the chance, I would love to do that. And it's just been um, a, a terrific journey, as you say, and uh, I've done that since 2008 and I uh, wouldn't give it up for anything. So thank you. And I'm Ashley Mullins. I'm the Dietetic Internship Program Manager, and I am a graduate alumni of this internship program and just had such a great experience. I've just um, stayed here as a full-time employee and doing really a variety of roles. I began as a clinical dietitian working in um, a rehabilitation facility and went on to do um, some critical care and acute care and had an opportunity to begin working in an outpatient facility and just really found a love for nutrition counseling and then moved to become a clinical nutrition manager as well. And through that experience, I was able to work with interns from a variety of programs in our area and just really enjoyed mentoring and um, teaching and working with interns and seeing them grow and learn. And so I continued to do that and uh, was also able to uh, gain some experience in food service management. And then an opportunity here became available and to uh, work full-time with interns. And so I've been doing this now, uh, this is my sixth internship class and just um, really enjoy it. And I am Holly McStravick, happy to be here. I uh, graduated from Texas A&M University in the class of 2018. Um, I would, I'm a graduate from this program at BUMC. I graduated in 2019 under Susan Roberts and uh, Ashley Mullins, uh, very capable hands. Um, I started off as a PRN clinical dietitian here right after the internship and um, started off as PRN for maybe a, a few months and then was hired on full time in um, the neuro ICU uh, neuro floor with that neurology um, center and then recently transitioned over into more cardiothoracic um, cardiovascular uh, patients. So I've been in that role um, for, I guess, about a, a little over a month now. So it's been great and I'm happy to be here. Well, we'll go through some slides and um, I'm actually going to hope that Ashley and Holly, if I miss a point or they have something else to add, jump in here. So our program really wants to invite students in and help develop that. We know that you come in with your own knowledge base from your undergraduate or a master's program. So we're, we're just encouraging you to take that knowledge base and come into our program and let us help you learn and develop to be a qualified registered dietitian nutritionist at entry level. 
as you know, I think everybody's aware, as of January 1st, 2024, all dietitians will need their master's degree in order to sit for the registration exam. So in preparation for that, we've been working to partner with the university, actually Texas A&M University, uh, to develop a master's internship uh, option. So this is a unique year for us. This year, we're actually going to have two tracks. We're going to have our traditional track of the dietetic internship only, and we will have a second cohort accepted that will go into our Masters of Clinical Nutrition DI program. So as you can see, our traditional program is a 10 month program. We start in August and the interns graduate in June and we will accept 12 interns into that program. And um, this is our final cohort that will go through the internship only. Our second cohort will go into our Masters of Clinical Nutrition, which is a 22 month program. And they will start their coursework in August of 2021 in, at Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. Uh, they'll complete that program over the year and then their second year, they'll come here to Dallas and carry out their supervised practice portion of the internship and graduate in June of uh, 2023, I think if I have that correctly. So here's another um, graph to, or timeline to show you how that works. Uh, the DI is 10 months. There is an option for nine hours of dual dual credit from Texas Women's University. And that just entails paying for tuition for those nine hours through TWU and you get the credit for the work within the internship. So it's a really a great opportunity for those of you who plan to get your master's and want to get that started. We'll start in August, as I said before, 2021, and you'll complete the program in June of 2022. And the DI MCN, as you can see, we've talked about some of that um, already, and I don't think I need to repeat that information. Our program is a long-standing program. We're very proud of it. Uh, we were the first civilian-based internship in the state of Texas and established back in 1953. I know that sounds like a long time ago to all of us. And here you can see some pictures of Boone Powell Sr. and Mary Ellen Danbold, who um, helped to establish the program here. They were very, had a lot of foresight. And here's our first class that uh, began in 1954, and it really makes me smile and maybe chuckle a little, I'm sure some of you too, to see the uniforms that our interns wore back then. Some days, you know, it might be nice to have a uniform instead of figuring out what you're going to wear, but um, yeah, so started in 1954, and here um, is our most recent class that graduated. They graduated in June of uh, 2020, and so far we have graduated over 500 interns from our program. Our program goals are probably um, similar to others that you've seen. We're, one of our program goals is to prepare graduates to be competent entry-level registered dietitian nutritionists. And we have specific objectives under that that involve you know, passing the registration exam, completing the internship within a certain time period, uh, obtaining different you know, positions within the, the profession. We also want to prepare the graduates to be professional and to be interested in continued learning. And those uh, metrics have to do with involvement in a professional organization and those that are going on to achieve uh, a graduate degree. And then in line with our organization's goals, we have a focus on community, commitment to community service. And so we look for our graduates to be involved in some way, whether it be in professional organizations, their church, their school, um, their community, and uh, looking for that continued involvement as we'd like to impart that, the importance of that. 
We also have a clinical nutrition therapy concentration, and uh, we have certain competencies associated with that. And some of this is driven by the organization here and the opportunities that we have in terms of complex patient populations. And so you can see that you would have opportunities to work with the neonates in the neonatal intensive care unit. And we have partnerships with pediatric facilities across the region um, so that you get to work with children with special needs. And of course, there's uh, both here at the Dallas campus and the Fort Worth campus, we have transplant patients. So that's another area that we feel like is important for you to have some experience with. Uh, most clinical dietitians understand nutrition-focused physical assessment and the importance of that, but sometimes the patient population that you conduct that in can be challenging. So with critically ill patients and transplant resist re recipients and also those with special needs in the pediatric population, uh, those that can be a little more challenging. So we, we work on that as well. Uh, we, we really focus on research. We have the, all the interns carry out a research project. Uh, so that is something else that's fairly innovative and different with our, pro with our program. And um, because our dietitians write enteral and parental nutrition orders, we do um, think that that's a great experience for our interns. And we, that is not um, a therapy or therapies without risk and benefits. So being able to understand if you're writing those orders, what those are is very important. And then, of course, um, that feeds into advanced practice skills like order writing and feeding tube placement uh, that we also concentrate on. So now I'm going to turn it over to Holly and let her share her experience within our internship. Yes, um, I am Holly McStravick again. I am a full time dietitian here and a graduate of the program. And so I do have some experience as to how um, each part of the internship kind of influenced how I am as a clinician, how I practice. Um, and so it, it starts with the two week orientation. And um, I would say, I would describe it as just a very hands-on orientation um, of reviewing concepts that you learned in undergraduate. Um, also probably some new concepts that maybe some full-time dietitians um, can share with you that maybe you didn't learn from a textbook. Um, so definitely lots of hands-on activities throughout this orientation um, and classes as well. So classes reviewing skills, reviewing knowledge, anything from reviewing enteral nutrition, um, parenteral nutrition, interpreting lab values, um, you know, nutrition focused physical exam, a, a class on that, as well as a, you can see in the picture, um, doing a physical exam on on the, um, I, I, do you call that a mannequin? <laughs> um, and as well, so the, the classes are taught by um, the full-time dietitians, most of them are. So I think it provides a pretty um, real time and fresh knowledge to um, the interns for, to, receiving all this information from uh, full-time RDs that um, use that information every day. Uh, so that was very valuable and helped me become prepared and feel prepared for my first clinical um, rotation and actually seeing my first patient. Um, I would say from orientation, my biggest takeaway and the thing that I kind of value the most from orientation was the, the uh, simulated patient experience. Um, there are, they have, they bring in actors and actresses to, um, you know, kind of follow a script for, um, whatever medical nutrition therapy, um, we're supposed to go in and do our ADIT and do our physical exam and, um, learn about the patient and do, um, and provide interventions and, um, it was kind of eye-opening to actually do that and see myself back um, prior to going to see patients in real life because it gives you a different perspective of what you need to work on before you actually go in to see the patient. So that was uh, pretty valuable and I think it 
made me kind of pinpoint on things to work on prior to actually even going into rotation. So that was pretty neat. Uh, so this slide kind of goes over um, various rotations. As you can see, there are a wide variety of pretty specialized um, rotations in every aspect as far as um, like food service, um, outpatient, uh, but especially the clinical medical nutrition therapy emphasis. Um, there are, there's a wide variety of very specialized rotations. So I, I was very excited to get into um, those rotations, not even really having been exposed to, you know, a bone marrow transplant patient before. So that was very exciting. Um, as far as uh, the rotations go, they're one to two weeks long, with the exception of staff relief, which is longer, but um, it's not broken up into chunks of like a month of clinical at a time, like some of my um, other, my peers that went to other internships did. And I viewed that as a, an advantage because it made me all the interns revisit concepts and um, I learn by repetition. And when I got back to uh, clinical at the end for staff relief, it really kind of, all the concepts were really kind of um, drilled into my head at that point after just going to clinical um, throughout the internship. So um, that was really nice. and. Um, if I had to pick a few, there are a lot here, but if I had to pick a few that stood out for me, I would say um, bone marrow transplant because I just think that that's very unique and uh, a great thing to learn um, those MNTs for, for those patients. Uh, trauma, which I ended up doing my staff relief in, um, seeing open abdomens and uh, how to care for a patient in GI discontinuity and just anything under the sun that you can think of um, that one patient would have. <laughs> so, um, and then as well as home infusion, I really enjoyed that uh, rotation as well. Just kind of seeing what all kind of goes into um, a patient's care in the home setting and um, kind of makes you in the inpatient setting uh, aware of what all needs to be set up and gives you more perspective into um, what all goes on it in a home setting. Um, and each one of these rotations, I feel, definitely made me a more well-rounded uh, clinician because you're not going to have one patient with diabetes and nothing else, maybe, but usually the patient has diabetes, maybe a history of transplant, maybe, you know, a stroke. So, having all of these rotations really kind of prepares you to be the right clinician to take care of a lot of different patients. So, um, so this slide uh, discusses our, the major projects. There are many of them. Um, first being the journal club presentation, which um, goes over, we, we select with our research coaches help. Um, we're assigned a research project, which I'll get into later. But with our research coaches' help, um, we select some articles that highlight the research in the current literature in that um, topic. So just for an example, um, my internship research project was regarding VV ECMO and caloric adequacy while on that therapy, and it does it affect mortality. And so we selected some journal articles, though there are very few at this point um, regarding, you know, how to feed a patient on BV ECMO. Um, and we present this to um, the full-time RDs. And uh, then we kind of, it kind of is a good segue into what our research is about. So we go over those, that literature and then discuss an intro into what our research is going to be about. Um, the study, the research design presentation is um, a more informal presentation than the others. Um, it just goes over what, um, what your design for your research is going to be, just like it says. And um, we present that to the full-time RDs and the clinical nutrition managers. And it's kind of an open forum at the end for suggestions as to um, what may or may not be realistic, what may or may not work, or um, things that 
maybe we should have thought about. So it kind of is a way to fine tune our design. Um, the research study presentation is kind of our big, big uh, presentation at the end where we um, dress, well, we, all, we dress professional for all of them, but it's definitely one to showcase all your hard work and the, the results of that research study that, um, that you did, you've been working on all year, you data collected for, you did the statistics and everything uh, all in that one presentation and we submit that research pap paper regarding that. Um, uniquely for me, uh, mine, like I said, was on VV ECMO and caloric adequacy and it was accepted uh, as an abstract for uh, an encore abstract for Aspen. So that was a unique experience to kind of actually go through that process. Um, National Nutrition Month, that is really kind of a chance for the dietitians and the dietetic interns to kind of work together um, and come up with some uh, unique and innovative ways to kind of get the hospital involved in um, just sharing knowledge about nutrition and um, that in the picture on the left, it's myself, a manager, and the, the chef, the head chef here, Chef Tom, um, sharing about spices. And he and his team cook uh, a recipe that we, um, we ask them to for whatever it fits for the topic that year. That, so that was fun to kind of organize, work together on. Um, and then the case study is one that each intern does um, Ashley and Susan come up with what um, rotation we pick that patient from, and we um, share the entire stay timeline, the prognosis of what the di diagnosis was, um, and what the therapy was, and um, just the entire stay. We dive into that patient's stay, and, and mine was a patient who newly was diagnosed with ALS. So it's a chance for us to kind of learn some specific MNT. Um, staff relief is at the end, and I feel that is definitely where I grew the most. Um, it is a, you're assigned to a specific area, specific dietitian in the hospital, and just like um, probably any other program, it is definitely um, a great opportunity to show your independence and uh, how you learned from each dietitian throughout the internship. And um, three to four weeks at the end of the internship, um, mine was in trauma, the trauma ICU with uh, one of our full-time dietitians. And um, I definitely learned a lot about how to communicate with the interdisciplinary team uh, how to prioritize my patients, um, how to most efficiently get my uh, day organized because it was just going to be me. My preceptor wasn't going to be seeing any of those patients. So you could be seeing anywhere between 15 to sometimes 20 patients a day. So making sure that you um, know how to organize your day and be independent and or prioritizing nutrition support patients over your patients who may eat by mouth. Um, that was just definitely a great way for me to kind of just jump right in and um, be the dietitian as close as I can get to it at that point. Uh, graduation was great. Um, I loved graduation. It was a great way to showcase uh, to our family members who, um, if, your family members are like mine. They had no idea what I was doing in the internship, um, but it was a good way for us to kind of show them what a dietitian does, um, what we've been working so hard for, and um, all of us to kind of get together and celebrate each other. Um, my favorite memory from graduation was actually walking to the car afterwards, and my little sister said, um, wow, Holly, that is so cool. I admire you for doing this. And it was just like, oh, wow. Thanks, Hattie. <laughs> um, so th they just really, they want to know what we do. And that graduation was a great way for, for them to find out. And my little sister thought it was the coolest thing. So <laughs>
Well, thank you, Holly. It's, it's really nice hearing the personal account of someone who's been through that. And uh, so thank you for sharing. Sure. I'm going to speak a little bit to the eligibility requirements for interested applicants. And so overall, a GPA of 3.0 is preferred. Um, and just keep our eligibility requirements are in line with Texas A&M's graduate program as well. So our applicants that who are uh, accepted into our program are then, if you've applied to the MCN DI track, will apply to Texas A&M graduate school. And so these requirements will fulfill both of, of those, um, of, of what's required. A verification statement is required um, for proof of completion of a DPD or the intent to complete in the DICAS application. And we are not requiring the GRE. Our website has been recently updated to reflect this. So acceptance to the graduate program at AM is not requiring the GRE. And this is a recent change. I just wanted to highlight that. And so upon acceptance and matching, we request the copies of the verification statements as well as transcripts um, showing your completion of your degree. Now to apply, we require a $75 application fee. And this is in addition to DICAS fees as well as D&D Digital. And so this is sent directly to us as a program and our address is featured there and it can be addressed to um, Dr. Roberts or myself with this address, and that just needs to be postmarked by the applicate, DICAS application deadline. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the things that we look for. We have a committee that works to review these applications that you've worked so hard on, and we're really looking for a variety of things, um, but uh, leadership and just ability to work well with people, and which is really shown through your work experiences, whether they be volunteer paid, as well as feedback from your letters of recommendation, which we do require that um, three letters and two of them from a professor in your uh, food and nutrition coursework, and then one from an employer. Now we understand sometimes everyone's experiences are slightly different. And so if you have a unique experience and are wondering who to request your letters from, we welcome you to contact us and get our insight. So um, we just really wanna make sure that they're requesting them from people who can truly speak to your abilities and know you as an individual um, that can write a very personal account of your ability to be successful in our program. So as I mentioned, once matched, that is when the application process to apply to Texas A&M will begin. And so we really, as you're making requests for letters of recommendation, keep in mind that the graduate acceptance, the graduate coursework will also require that. And so it's really, um, I would ask your people to also write a letter and just modify it for the graduate um, program as well. So that just is a more efficient process for those individuals and you can have those on hand. And that's not uncommon if you're applying to a program that has um, both the master's degree as well as the internship. And then of course the personal statement, which I know we're gonna probably talk a little bit more about, but um, this is just really our opportunity to get to know you, hear a little bit more about your journey and your goals and desires to be a registered dietitian as well as desire to be in our program. And we do not require interviews. We love to meet our prospective students and interns um, this year has been a little unique, and so we have not done on-site tours, but we love to meet with you virtually. We schedule time via phone, as well as we've hosted some virtual sessions. So just we really encourage people to reach out, connect with us. Uh, we love to get to know you and want you to have an opportunity to get to know us, just so that it's, it's a good fit from, from both sides. So once matched, there's just a few required things to be aware of. And again, we spoke about the verification statements that are required. Um, all of our interns do undergo the official hiring process of Baylor Scott and White Health, and that does require a drug screen physical, which does include nicotine screening and background checks. And interns are required to carry insurance, both health and auto insurance. You need reliable transportation and liability malpractice insurance and CPR certification. There's, um, as Holly mentioned, quite an orientation process and we have plenty of time once matched that we go through all of this to get our interns set up for the year. 
Here's just a little bit more information on the graduate degree and details. Um, you can visit Texas A&M's website if you are interested in the MCN program and um, as well as financial aid opportunities that would be available as a full-time graduate student. Um, as year one, as we mentioned, is coursework completed at Texas A&M and the year two, you are still an enrolled student at Texas A&M as you're enrolled in coursework that entire time. Some of it being dual credit for completing supervised practice as well as completing a couple of additional courses. So if you have questions about specific fees related to the graduate coursework, that can be found here at the student business office as well for Texas A&M. So with the estimated expenses, keep in mind this unique year, we have the dietetic internship only, which our estimated expenses account for that 10 month time frame. You have the optional dual credit from Texas Women's University, which would be additional expenses if you opt to do that. And then the estimated expenses for the MCN internship track include the 22 month time frame of starting graduate coursework in year one with the continuation of supervised practice in year two as well as enrolled course um, credit hours during that year two. So this is just an additional breakdown of those expenses. These are available on our website for additional review. And so this first one features the estimated expenses for that 10 month with just the dietetic internship if you are a uh, non-resident and you're opting for that dual credit, just note that tuition costs will um, vary. And these are just estimated based on feedback. We continuously request from our interns on just housing costs and their typical expenses. This slide will highlight the expenses for the 22-month um, the program with the master's degree. And so again, the estimated tuition is for uh, the 22 month time frame, and whether you're a um, Texas resident or non resident, it will affect your costs. We do schedule time off for our interns. We try to keep everything synchronized as much as possible, but we do know life happens. Um, we provide currently a um, the day of Thanksgiving and the day after is a holiday, and the there's a two week break over the course of Christmas and New Year's. And we do still also have a spring break. And so that time is all synchronized for interns to be off. We have been able to utilize that time as well if interns should have um, additional time they need to make up for any life events that have taken place. And we, on our website, we talk about a site preference form. We have had the opportunity to expand the number of interns over the years in our program by using other facilities within our health system. And so if you are open to having some of your rotations completed there, you will complete this site preference form and mail it with your application fee that is postmarked by the DICAS application deadline. And just you will complete roughly between maybe six to eight of your rotations at the sites for, for rotations that we can really provide a standardized learning experience as the interns here would have. And so it's just an opportunity to um, network and work in just a different hospital with different dietitians and preceptors. And we've seen it works well, maybe for students who have, are going to be living closer um, west and rather than here in Dallas for financial reasons, or students who are gonna be living, who don't live there, they found it's a great way to um, just learn from a um, different group. And it's just slightly smaller, but still very large hospital and um, they will often do their staff relief there and has turned into some great job opportunities for those individuals as well. We do have a scholarship that's provided during the internship during the supervised practice portion of the program and this is from Boone, uh, Boone Powell Sr. who is just um, a great supporter in this program and this uh, scholarship has been established and there's a process to complete a interview as well as an essay and um, we nominate six interns to apply for this based on their performance and it's always a very um, difficult decision but it's a great way just to we award this at graduation to give back for just all of the outstanding work that's been done. So travel and transportation um, we are located in Dallas Texas which is a large city 
We call this the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and it uh, can have a lot of traffic. And so we just, um, most rotations do take place on our main campus, but uh, many do take place in the surrounding Metroplex. And so I would say the farthest rotations we have currently would be driving about an hour, but again, all varies based on traffic. And so just to be prepared, not all sites will have public transit um, that is convenient but some may, and um, so just something to plan ahead for and get um, get adjusted to. So if you opt to apply, we, with this unique year of having the two tracks, there will be two options in DICUS and D&D Digital to rank. And so if you are opting to plan uh, to apply to both of our program tracks, we're offering just one application fee is all that $75 required, but then you would need to submit the appropriate fees to Tychus and D&D Digital um, for applying to both programs. As I mentioned, we are, would love to meet and connect with you and you're welcome to email uh, myself or Dr. Roberts. All right, thank you for that overview. It's very informative. I'm gonna jump right into the five questions that I ask all of the programs that come on the podcast. And these were put together with the help of my students to make sure I was asking the questions that they really wanted to know. So my first question is, what is one thing in particular that you just really love to see when you're reading an applicant's personal statement? I'll start out. I, I think that um, it's, as Ashley mentioned, it's a way for us to get to know you. And you know, as we review your personal statement, we really like to hear about you know, why you decided to be a registered dietitian, what your career goals are, and how that ties into your success at our program. So connecting the dots between those three things are something we really like to see. Yes, and I'll add to, I think that um, we don't want the personal statement to just be a narrative of the resume. I think that the resume can speak for itself as well as experiences in the DICUS application. And so the personal statement is a chance to be more personal and um, share with us a little bit about you since we don't get to meet everyone or do interviews, um, just to be very thoughtful and more hearing more of your goals and a little bit about who you are. Holly, did you um, want to share anything about your personal statement and how you crafted it? Sure. Um, so it's, it's been a little bit now, but um, I just remember wanting to showcase exactly that. Um, I did go ahead and um, tour the facility. This was before COVID. So I did do an in-person um, tour. And so I got that exact advice from you guys and um, did Kind of want to highlight my journey as to why I wanted to get into being a registered dietitian, um, what led me to that, what the challenges have been throughout accomplishing getting to that goal um, up until that point of applying and how I troubleshooted um, each of those challenges. Um, I think I also highlighted a, a good amount of my work experience and how that influenced just kind of um, strengthening and uh, reaffirming those goals to become a registered dietitian and that I was on the right track for that. All right. Well, my second question is a true or false question. True or false, an applicant's resume should be one page and one page only. Either way, why? Well, Ashley and I actually, you know, talked about these questions in advance a little bit, and we, we hate to box things in one way or the other, but in general, we think unless somebody is on a second career that one page can be adequate and the application itself can supplement <laughs> what's um, on the resume. Anybody else have anything they want to yes, add? Yes, I, I think that is a common question we hear, but I would say I wouldn't put as much focus on one page or two because you know, many have had to, and we will still review it. But I think what is more important is, is it organized? Is it relevant? And so if you find it's disorganized, that can make it lengthy. And if you have information that's not relevant, it will make it lengthy. So 
So that's more the point to focus on rather than how long it is. And so for most traditional students, one page will cover that adequately. And as um, Susan said, unless, you know, there are unique circumstances to consider with if you have more than one career. All right, so what is one thing an applicant may do? And this could be in interactions before they apply or in their, the application itself, something that they would do or multiple things they could do that would raise some red flags for you to where you would think, okay, maybe this person isn't a good fit for our program. Well, again, I think it's never probably one thing that would be a deal breaker. We like to look at the whole picture and uh, obviously we have a selection committee as Ashley discussed and we really get a lot of insight from the different members of the committee in terms of what's the red flag for one person and discussing that. But for me, um, one of the things that uh, is a red flag is often I mean, not often, but sometimes we see in personal statements that not only do they want to be a dietitian, but then they want to move on and be a physician or something else. And for me, I like to focus on somebody that um, is applying to our program that intends, I mean, people change their mind, but intends to be a registered dietitian for their career and profession. So for me, that's somewhat of a red flag. And I would say, something the time before you are actually accepted is just really important um, anytime someone can come tour talk to us on the phone even the email communication it, it's in a sense like you're applying for a job and so anything of concern that's unprofessional whether it be attire um, unprofessional communication or a lack of preparedness in maybe just the um, the questions they're asking is I think you really want to show that you've gone above and beyond to invest in learning about the program. And so if we're not getting, if you answer someone's, if we answer a student's questions, it's great if they can, you know, respond or um, if they sign up for sessions, you know, to, to attend or keep communication going. We know things happen. So um, just as if you were working somewhere and you can't come in for a shift, you know, just keep that person informed. So just overall professionalism is something that really can, um, um, make someone shine before they're even um, in, accepted to the program. All right. So what is one area of the program that you're actively working on trying to make even better for the interns? Ashley, I'll let you answer this one. We talked about it. But... Sure. Well, we are always soliciting feedback from not only our interns, but our preceptors. And I think that we are, we have so many great preceptors that we really see them as the subject matter experts and they're the ones seeing what's happening when their interns are in the rotations. And so we meet um, annually, but also we make updates really throughout the year based on feedback interns submit through their weekly rotation summaries and evaluations. Yeah, and to give kind of an example um, of the continuing sort of um, review of how the internship is organized or specific rotations, I would say whenever I was an intern, our first clinical rotation was um, gen med or gen general medicine. And um, the year after me, I ended up being a preceptor and the change was made to make that rotation two weeks long rather than one and make it general medicine and intro to ICU critical care. So. I thought that was a great way to um, introduce interns to patient care as for general medicine, but also um, preparing for a definite jump in um, acuity to that ICU level of care. So um, I think that is a big advantage and a good example of how listening to the preceptors and the interns um, to better the rotations, definitely. Right, and I think we have another example of that with from our pediatric um, hospitals who are outside of, of Baylor Scott and White that we used to have all of 12 of our interns spend one week at three different facilities and a preceptor there suggested because of the learning curve associated with being in a different facility, a different medical record, a different population, could we please have the interns for three weeks? So we changed to having 
four interns spend three weeks at each of the facilities instead of spending one week at each. And we really got positive feedback about that. Well, my last question of the five is a two-part question. The first part is, what are the three best adjectives, descriptors, or phrases that you feel best describes your program overall? Okay, well, I'll start out. Um, we collaborated on this answer as well. We would describe our program as being organized, not only because there's a lot of digital components to the work that we do, whether it be the evaluations or all the documents that are needed and the information that everyone needs, whether they be preceptors or interns, but we really do have the whole year planned out for the interns when they arrive, given that there can be unplanned circumstances come up and changes have to be made, but the interns know the first week they're here, what their rotations will look like and where they'll be for the rest of the year. So that's uh, one of the descriptors. Uh, we feel like we're innovative with um, the high level of clinical practice we have here. Interns have a lot of um, options to see what a dietitian can do at the highest level of practice and along with the research, which is innovative as well. And then supportive, um, we have a mentor-mentee program. And so we match each intern with a, a dietitian who acts as their mentor throughout the year. We round with the interns. We always have an open door policy to help interns. And I think Ashley does a particular great job at staying in touch and having the pulse of what's going on with each intern and whether it's a personal issue or an issue with a rotation and helping work through those things. We have weekly class time where we can touch base with the interns. Um, we have intern research coaches that spend a lot of time with interns through that process. And um, they also we hear a lot that the interns feel very supported by their preceptors. I think our preceptors are one of our greatest strengths. And I'll let Ashley talk about descriptors sure. of applicants. Um, so I think it's so hard to sum that up for an applicant, but what we've just observed is I think that applicants that are, have a growth mindset are very successful in knowing that this is very different than the academic setting is we're not having you come here to be tested or be given a grade. You are coming here to learn. And so I, I know when we introduced the research project at the beginning of the year, I, you can see just them shaking in their seats and feel that you say the word statistics is very scary, but you know, I say we're here to learn how to do research and not be tested on it and we get out the books together and, and conquer it together. Um, so being growth-minded is, is really, really important. Similar to that is just, I would say, being flexible. Um, we try to plan as much as we can out and stay organized, but things change and being flexible to um, schedule changes, um, curriculum changes, presentation dates changing, um, just seeing those an opportunity to overcome and be flexible. And then lastly, just being an initiator, I think in terms that really initiate opportunities to learn, um, we'll learn more. And those who take initiative to develop relationships will have more mentors and feel more supported. And um, so it's not always going to um, be them tracking you down, but if you seek those opportunities, you're, you're just gonna gain so much more from the program. Right. Yeah, you definitely hit on the, the second half of the, the applicant's ideal characteristics. Holly, did you have any additional thoughts on, on ways to describe the program or an ideal applicant? Um, I, I wouldn't say I have other words to describe. I just would say um, just I feel like I was successful in the internship by remaining flexible and trying to be an initiator. Um, take the initiative during rounds, during my rotation uh, in ICU rounds, um, just getting to know providers um, and just making that transition from an intern to a registered dietitian, making that myself so much more confident. So I would say that Ashley definitely hit the nail on the head that you get so much more out of it if you do stay true to those um, ideals throughout the internship. 
And I think Holly is a great example just of being uh, managing time because Holly decided and got married during the internship <laughs> program, but you would have never known it and never skipped a beat. Just really good at prioritizing what needed to be done and balancing her time and keeping good communication with us as well as her preceptors. So I think that's a great skill to have. And, and she definitely um, um, set the bar there. <laughs> well, thanks. I wouldn't recommend it to the future <laughs> classes, but <laughs> life yeah, happens. <laughs> I think um, unique individuals can do that successfully, which she did. But. <laughs> All right. Well, I just have a few additional questions to round us out. So what type of RD exam review do you offer your students? And then how well are the interns doing on the RD exam? Um, Susan, I can speak to this if you like in our what we review. So we require interns to um, utilize a review course or tool uh, of some type, but we don't mandate which type. It is not incorporated into the two, uh, internship costs at this time. And we normally will organize a few um, graduates to speak to their experiences, more tell them maybe tips of how they prepared. We provide an overview of resources available and stay in good touch with them um, to see what they're doing and learning about how they are preparing. And our, we have 100% first time uh, pass rate, and I'm sorry, not first time pass rate, 100% pass rate of the RDN exam within that year and I believe 89% first time pass rate uh, as well. So um, Susan, um, did you have anything to add? No, I don't think so. I think that's another example of an area where we just continually evaluate is what we're doing, is what we're doing work. And we even, we, you know, surveyed the group uh, recently just to understand, you know, what were their challenges? What could we do in the future with our interns to make them as successful as possible? Mm -hmm. And I would I would say to add, um, I started off working with visual veggies, um, and while for some would be a great review, um, I quickly learned that referring back to undergraduate, I definitely prefer like a more outline um, study um, style. And so the Inman review really kind of uh, worked in the end for me. Okay, so switching back to thinking about applicants, what have you seen as far as the average number of applicants over the last couple of years? Well, I mean, I think Ashley can correct me if I'm wrong, but we've averaged probably in the low to mid nineties up until, up until around um, 115 to 120 over, I'd say over the last five years. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So my last question is a brand new question that I have been getting very constantly from students since the end of last semester. Are your interns getting vaccinated? <laughs> yes, we, um, we just started uh, having the vaccine available in our hospital uh, towards the end of December and the interns, while the hospital is not mandating the um, vaccination at this point. The majority of our interns have, have received their first dose and they will get the second dose as well. But um, yes, it's available to them. Is that something going forward if you have incoming interns in the fall that to that point hadn't had the opportunity to get vaccinated, they didn't fit into a particular category of priority? Will the interns in your program then become a priority to make sure that they're vaccinated? I don't know if we know the answer to what will be happening in the fall, but if they're still uh, uh, giving vaccines to healthcare workers, we're in that category and the interns are part of that. So yes, they would be eligible. All right. Yeah, I think I get that question once a day about <laughs> <laughs> that is what really students are concerned and thinking about these days, which I totally understand. All right, to close us out on this episode, I would love for each of you just to give one quick take home message for potential applicants this year or next year or any year in the future. Well, one thing I like to encourage is that I know that the internship application process is intimidating and can be competitive. And so whenever I meet with someone who comes to our program, although we would love to have you at our program, 
is just to remind you a perspective that this may be one or at most two years of your entire career ahead of you. And so to be flexible in your application process, um, you know, in your rankings and where you apply and to be open-minded to lots of programs, because ultimately what's important is um, that credential and getting the RDN, becoming that expert. And um, by doing that, you can continue in your career and then you love what we have to offer, then come apply for a job later. So it won't hold you back from achieving your dreams or your goals and um, so that you can get through that application process. Yeah, I would say that we have many um, applicants who matched our program. We really have different goals in mind and not necessarily clinical, which we're clinically focused. So I've seen a lot of them be successful in sports nutrition or eating disorders or different areas. But it is um, this program, even though it's clinically focused, it can help you be successful in other areas as well. But then we've also had the flip side where somebody really thought, well, I'm here and I didn't really want to do clinical, but this is what I got. Um, and they fall in love with it. And a lot of times they do work for us. So it kind of goes back to that growth mindset and flexibility and open-mindedness that we talked about earlier as you come into a program and just encouraging you to you know, let it flow in and you know, realize that you not what you say you want to do initially, it, it may change during the program. And I would say my advice is also a little bit more geared towards in during the internship. Um, definitely, I would encourage each intern to treat each rotation as though it's pretty much a job interview. Um, I, I think you gain a lot by treating it that way and being professional. And even if you're not interested, because the reality is sometimes you, you just know you're not going to do a rotation for your career, but always show interest, show you want to be there show respect. Um, the preceptor is definitely putting their time for you and for your growth. So that goes a long way with um, treating each rotation like it's a job interview, because you never know what uh, opportunities can come along later. All right. Well, thank you, all of you, for being with me today. And for those at home who would like more information about the program at Baylor University Medical Center, I provided the link to their program website in the description below this video. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode with another awesome dietetic internship. And we'll see you next time.